Welcome to this week's Sail From Home session. Each week we'll be chatting to a special guest from the boating world. Today we're joined by Ella MacArthur and we're going to be talking to her about the Ella MacArthur Cancer Trust. So Ellen, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, absolute pleasure to, to catch up with you. Am I right in thinking it was sort of back in your Vendée day, sort of 2000, 2001, that you were sort of first inspired for sort of setting up the trust? I mean, yeah, it's hard to believe it was 20 years ago, actually. It feels like literally yesterday. Um, but during the preparation for the Vendée Globe, I was invited to go and sail with a French charity which took young people in recovery from cancer and leukaemia sailing. And it was actually the brother of a girl who worked on the team. Okay. And I jumped at the chance. Uh, he'd been through leukaemia, hence he got involved with the organisation. And as I got closer to the boats in Brest in France, which was where the sailing was, I suddenly began to feel really nervous. And I thought, you know, I, I've never worked with young people before. Um, I've certainly never worked with French young people before. My French was 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 OK, but but not you know, amazing. You, you know, I couldn't talk slang with young people. Um, <laughs> but within a few minutes of getting on the boats, I was having more fun than I'd had in years. And these young people just completely blew me away. You know, their passion for life, their their sense of fun, they were just extraordinary young people and it really affected me in, in a you know in a very positive way. I was so impressed with them that I kept in touch with many of them. I went to see some in hospitals around Paris shortly after before the Vendée Globe that, that winter um, and I carried a plaque with a hundred of their names on on the boat when I raced around the world in the Vendée. We had competitions to, to paint model boats um, before the start and then when I finished the Vendée Globe a whole group of young people came on coaches from Strasbourg uh, with the doctors and nurses literally out of hospital. They travelled all the way, they saw me finish and then overnight they drove back to the hospital and it was absolutely extraordinary. I'm sure the impact of, of those guys turning up to see you coming in across the finish line must have been immense for you. It was amazing actually, you know, having had the, the communication with them when I was at sea and one specific moment actually which I'll mention in a moment in the Southern Ocean which which was a a real describe it a, 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 it was a moment for me and the last thing I remember doing that night of the finish was you know in all the craziness of finishing the Vendée Globe was before I went back to sleep as I went to the coach it was about to leave and I ran onto the coach and saw all the young people and I went back in the car and went off to have my first night sleep on land in three months um, and it was really, it was a, it was a pivotal moment, and, and I'll mention what happened at sea actually because it's so relevant. Um, I'd obviously been in touch with these young people and following them, and I carried this plaque with their names on on the on the boat. And um, in the middle of the Southern Ocean, I was just off the Kegelan Islands, and I was trying to pass over the Kegelan Plateau, which meant I had to sail as deep as possible as, as I could. Uh, the wind was increasing. I had a small staysail which I um, was able to carry out to the side of the boat to, to allow me to sail deeper. Um, and the wind was go getting stronger and stronger and it was going OK, it was going OK. And then suddenly there was a massive squall that changed direction and the boat jibed and uh, the headsail blew off. Um, in fact, I was on the bow when the headsail blew off. Wow. The boat lay completely on its side, um, completely on its side. Uh, so I was kind of monkey barring back along the guardrail, which was now kind of horizontal above my head. And I managed to get back to the cockpit and because she has a swing keel, I managed to get her the right way up and sort out the staysail and sort out the mainsail and I realised that actually one of the battens was stuck over the second spread at halfway up the mast and there's no way I could reduce sail further unless I climbed the mast and pulled this batten out and so obviously very quickly as the wind was still increasing I managed to get all the gear together and I climbed the mast a bit like a monkey um, and I got up to the top and I uh, where the cross tree was and I pulled the batten out and I managed to slide it down the sail back into the cockpit um, and then I realised I'd left one of the pieces of equipment behind that I needed to get safely down so I literally had to detach myself from the mast climb down and then reattach if I wanted to be held which obviously meant there was a significant period of time that I was not attached to the mast at all and um and just after the descent from the first spreader I slipped my foot slipped and I was hanging on to the sail with a hand on one loop of the loops that we put on the luff of the sail and uh, I was banging into the sail and I tried and I tried and I tried to get my foot in I couldn't do it and I obviously wasn't attached to the mast and you know this was you know 60 foot waves in the southern ocean it wasn't you know sailing across a pond so it was pretty violent um, and uh, and the one thing that came into my head was those kids and it was the fact that you know you can't you cannot fall you cannot fail because those kids are following you and it's weird you think it would be my family or but no it was the kids who came into my head and I thought come on you, you've got to get down and 
the whole thing took me about two and a half hours, I think, in total. But I managed to get back down to the deck. And obviously, the rest is history. But that was a, a very important moment in my Vendée Globe. I guess what we sort of moved forwards a couple of years, do we? And then what you've with amazing sort of achievement of becoming fastest fastest person around the world. And and am I right in thinking it was round about sort of two thousand and three? Is that is that right when when you set up the trust? Yeah, I um, realised there was no charity in the UK that did what this French charity Ashak on Son Cap did, and. Um, you know, I was asked to stay involved with the Shack and Song Cap, which I, I did, but I thought it's such a shame there's nothing that, that happens in the same way over here. So it was 2003 we set up the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust. Our first trip was in 2004, the year before I went off the, around the world in the in the Trime Ran. Mm. Uh, um, and, you know, you, again, there's that nervousness. Is this going to work? Is this going to be the same as, as the trips in France? You know, it, maybe it won't work. And you have all of those horrendous thoughts of, you know, maybe we're doing the wrong thing. And... You know, one of the girls arrived and she arrived in a wheelchair and she was literally at, come out of hospital and, and she was in tears and her mum was in tears because the parents dropped off at that time and you think, oh, are we doing the right thing? And then um, she climbed on the boat, still crying, and we, we, she was very emotional and we set off to sail down Southampton Water, which is where we started from back then. And uh, slowly the tears stopped and, you know, she was there with four other girls and we had the most fantastic time. It was an amazing four-day trip but miraculously when we went back to Southampton and a mum came to pick up this this girl who had gone down to the boat in a wheelchair with two sticks um literally ran up the pontoon to her mum that trip was the light at the end of the tunnel for her that trip was the switch that said I'm getting better I mean she'd had spinal cancer she'd had two vertebrae removed it was pretty serious stuff and yet that that girl was was on the mend and you know, to, to be part of that process and to see that incredible transformation firsthand was, was amazing. And, you know, since then, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people in the UK have been helped in that same way, that transformational trip. And it's not really about sailing. It's about putting those young people or enabling those young people to be in an environment where they can be themselves, where they can look forward, where they forget their cancer. Um, and some talk about it, some don't. But actually, it's it's this amazing transformational experience that enables them to have something to talk about you know they go home they never stop talking about their experiences they're 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 full of life and and so many parents send letters saying thank you for giving us our son or daughter back i mean it really is quite extraordinary it's an it's an amazing amazing organization where do you see the the trust going forwards and obviously 2020's had some challenges well it's it's interesting you talk about where we see ourselves going because since that first trip in 2004 we've evolved so much we have a southern and a northern base um, anyone north of Nottingham goes to the Scottish base in Largs anyone south comes down to the Isle of Wight for their first trip and then we have lots of other events staggered around the country outdoor pursuits um, go to the Lake District uh, so the young people have an opportunity to come back and work with us for another four-day trip and often meet young people again who they were with for the very first time on that initial trip so all the first trips are on a yacht for four days in the north or the south And then we offer many opportunities for young people to come back, both on the yachts as volunteers and also to these return to sales or the the more inland and coastal events. Um, So we have a a very long relationship with the young people that we work with. You know, we're not an organisation that sails with young people for four days and then says goodbye. It's not a a one off, you know, amazing sailing trip. It's a relationship that's there for as long as those young people need us. And you know, we have young people who are volunteers in their 20s who came with us in their teens, uh, some have families, some have kids, um, you know, they're adults now, they have jobs, they're, you know, they're out in the real world living normal lives. And what you find with young people is when they're in hospital, they meet other kids with cancer. But what they don't meet is adults who had cancer as a child. And now being, having been there since 2004, having had many, many, many trips and enabling those young people to come back, and in fact, you know, encouraging them to come back if that's what they want to do as volunteers. And that really has lit a beacon for many of the young people who are sailing for the first time. And what that's enabled us to do is evolve as an organisation to keep those relationships long term. And I think that's really helped us in 2020 with all the, the COVID crises. You know, we have relationships with hundreds of young people around the UK, you know, both volunteers and um, people who've just been on one trip, people who are due to come on the first trips this year. And What we've done is we've gone out to those young people and we've said, how can we best help you? Okay, we can't go sailing. It's not safe in 2020. We don't believe it's safe. 
how can we help you? What is it you miss about the trips? You know, what is it that you value so much about the trips? And we've tried to create all of that virtually. And we've had, for volunteers, we've had online RAA courses, we've had virtual hangouts, we've had presentations on all sorts of things from body image to fertility. Because there are some real challenges for so many young people who go through cancer that you wouldn't give a second thought unless you were faced with, you know, that horrendous situation. So, so actually, we've tried to be there to support as much as we possibly can through 2020. And of course, with a view to being back out there again on the water in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. What can we expect to see in, in 21? Are there, are there learnings and activities that have been additional that you've set up this year that you, you're you going to keep doing to, to sort of help maintain that, maintain the engagement with the young people? Or? I don't think any of us would have wanted to you know, go into a year and face what we've faced this year. I mean, the whole world's been thrown upside down. Um, all our lives have. I think there's you know, very few people in the world who haven't been touched in some way by this crisis. So, you know, we've we've not taken this on thinking how fantastic we're going to, you know, evolve and learn new things, but we've had to, like we all have. And we've tried many things and we know some of those things will work better than others, but we've gone out there, we've tried to serve the needs of the young people as much as possible, provide what we can to the, the highest level as possible. And I think what we've learned through this year is that um, many of those things actually really work. And because they're virtual, everything's virtual, there's no reason we can't carry those on through into 21, 2021 and beyond. You know, we've had a book club for over 18s. We've had a pen pal um, uh, club set up for under 18s so young people can write to each other. And some of those things that they, you know, once you instigate them, they just carry on and those friendships are maintained and those relationships are maintained, which is ultimately what we're all about. So I think we have learned a lot this year. You know, we've had to learn. We've had to innovate this year. And I'm absolutely certain that, that some of those things will carry on in the long term, maybe many. Um, but we were really, really keen to see if 2021 is the year we can get back to the water because you know obviously we've I think that the trust has done the most amazing job for the young people everything we do is about the young people and putting them first and um, but it'll be wonderful if we can con continue to do those those virtual things in the background and take the young people on the water then actually we'll be stronger in 2021 than we ever have been before. For any any young people that would be interested in getting involved in the trust, what's what's the route they need to take? The best way to learn about the trust is to go onto the trust website. All the information is there. You can find out about the trips, how they happen, um, and all the activities are posted from there. And actually, we have representatives uh, through other organisations in hospitals right around the country who understand exactly what the trust does and helps to connect the trust activities with those young people. So if you're a young person going through cancer treatment at the moment, They'll vary, and in one of the children's specialist cancer centres in the UK, there will be someone that can be connected to you who can tell you about the trust activities. But if you'd like to know who that is, go to the website. Everything's there, and you'll be able to link into the trust team. And and I think also, you know, this year, if you are one of those young people, it's been a really, really tough year for mm -hmm. so many people. But even more so if you're a young person going through cancer treatment. I mean, this year has been brutal. So many of those young people have already had to self-isolate. They had to do that when they went through their treatment. They've had to do that. You know, some of them are having bone marrow transplants in rooms, literally, where, where nothing comes in or out. You know, they've been through that. And to have this on top, I think that, that really has been extra tough. So, so let's hope that 2021 is a, is a better year for everybody. And yourself personally, you've had those sort of challenging moments, self, ultimately self-isolating, but out in a 60-foot piece of carbon in the you know, middle of the ocean. Um, how did you best overcome those challenging points, I suppose? For me, it was always about looking through to the other side. Mm. So we have some pretty dramatic, horrendous moments on a boat. You have some beautiful and amazing ones as well. I would always think through to the other side. So I'd always visualise the other side. So you know, the storm I was in on the round the world record, it was Christmas Day. There was a horrendous storm. If I'd have slipped to the south, I would have well, probably died because I'd have ended up going beneath the depression, which had 70 knots of wind on the backside of it. Um, so I had to stay to the north and beat the boat up and keep going as fast as I could to stay in front of this storm. I'd say that was a, a, a fairly um, frightening moment and it was it certainly made you, you know, you're living on your nerves. But for me, the way I dealt with that was was stay on it, concentrate on what I can do now. Always concentrate on the, on the boat, make sure the boat's OK. Check, 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 check. Keep yourself in one piece, which is easier said than done when you're so stressed and it's so difficult to get any sleep whatsoever but then also think through to the other side. The positivity for me was always maintained by thinking through to the other side, thinking tomorrow will be better. And it wasn't always, but tomorrow I would be thinking the next day would be better. And eventually it was, and that was how I would deal with things mentally.